Backpacking can be a fun experience full of beautiful scenic adventures and all kinds of memories that you won't forget, but sometimes those memories don't turn out to be so positive. These viewers sent in their allegedly true experiences while backpacking out in the great outdoors. Whether that's snaking canyons, deep in the woods, or something else just in the outdoors, you never know what you may find while being out there. Welcome back to The Swamp, my friends, and welcome if you're new. Today, we're going to be sharing some creepy and allegedly true backpacking horror stories sent in by viewers just like you. As always, if you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit it at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I'd love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. Now, without further ado, let's get right into these creepy and allegedly true backpacking horror stories. My Family Doesn't Backpack Anymore by Jonathan I remember my family's backpacking trip when I was 10. It was just... it was just like yesterday, it's so clear in my head. We were in the middle of nowhere surrounded by towering trees that seemed to reach up to the night sky. It was peaceful and quiet, with only leaves rustling in the wind and birds chirping off in the distance. But then, everything suddenly changed. We were walking along a trail when I saw something move out of the corner of my eye. At first, I thought it was just a deer or something of the sort, but as it got closer, I realized it was something else entirely. It was deer-like in appearance, but its eyes, its eyes were glowing a bright red, and its antlers were twisted and gnarled like something out of a nightmare. I screamed and ran off, but the creature was behind me in a matter of seconds, its hooves pounding right behind me. I could feel its hot breath on the back of my neck, and I knew that if I slowed down even for a millisecond, it would catch me, and my life would be over. I could hear my family calling out to me, but I just couldn't stop. I was far too afraid, too consumed by the terror of being chased by this monster. I didn't know what it wanted, but I knew it was nothing good. I ran, for what felt like hours, my head pounding from dehydration, my chest heaving in pain, and my legs aching with exhaustion. Finally, I stumbled and fell to the ground, breathing a ragged gasp. But when I turned around, the creature was nowhere to be seen. It had vanished as if it had never been there at all. I was shaking with fear and it took my family quite a while to catch up to me and calm me down. They tried to tell me that it was just my imagination, that there was no such thing as monsters, but I know what I had seen. Years later, I'm still having nightmares. I, I think about that day all the time. It's just something that just won't escape my mind. I'll never forget that terror. I'll never forget when I had that feeling of being hunted by something that shouldn't exist. I know this story might seem a little anticlimactic, and I do apologize for that, but it's just something I had to share with you all. Outdoor Adventures Can Be Deadly by Aiden Chaos I had always been a pretty avid adventurer, honestly and spent most of my trips solo. So, I jumped when my friend invited me on a group backpacking trip through the Canadian wilderness. We were both experienced hikers and had all the gear we needed to survive a few days in the great outdoors. But as soon as we set foot on the trail, I knew something was off. The air just felt heavy, and the trees seemed to loom over us like sentinels, watching over our every move. We hiked for hours, making our way deeper and deeper into the wilderness. After some time, the sun began to set and we decided to set up camp for the night where we were. We built a fire and cooked some food we brought along, chatting and laughing as we watched the stars emerge. It truly was a serene and beautiful sight. But unfortunately, as the night wore on, things started to get more strange. We heard noises off in the distance, at first, I really tried to play it off as animals. It did sound like something was just moving through the underbrush, and that could literally be anything. We tried to think it off as a bear or some other wild animal, like I said, but as we listened closer, the sounds were more than just strange. They were otherworldly. Then we saw it. At first, it was just a flicker of movement on the edge of our vision, but then it stepped into the light of our fire, 
and we fully saw what this thing was. I don't even know how to explain it other than that it was humanoid, but its skin was sickly green. Its eyes glowed with an otherworldly light. It had long, spindly fingers, and its limbs were twisted and distorted like it didn't quite belong in our world. We all froze, me and my friend, staring at each other and then looking back at this creature, too scared to move or even breathe. The creature just stood there, watching us with these glowing eyes. They were ethereal, its head cocked to the side as if studying us, and then it was gone, vanishing into the darkness as it had never been there. It's something that I don't know how we explain. It just faded from existence, slowly but surely, as if you were watching a movie or some sort of really bad cheesy effect on some sort of sci-fi scene or something. I really don't know how to put it into words. It was just there, and then it simply dissolved. We spent the rest of the night huddled together, too afraid to sleep or even speak. We knew we had encountered something unworldly that didn't belong here. The following day, we packed our gear, hiked back to civilization as quickly as possible, and we never really spoke of that night again. But I'll never forget the terror I felt when I realized we were not alone in the wilderness, and to this day, I just… I don't know how to explain how something can simply fade out of existence. I know we were tired, but we didn't do drugs and we didn't drink. If anybody has any idea what we encountered, please let me know in the comments. There's a reason people stay on the trail by Anonymous. I remember the backpacking trip my friends and I took in rural Virginia like it was yesterday. It was supposed to be a fun weekend getaway, a chance to explore the great outdoors and escape the city life's hustle and bustle. We set off into the wilderness early on a Saturday morning, our backpacks filled with all the essentials we need for the weekend. The trail wound through all of this forest, and the trees were tall and imposing on either side of us. And at first, it was all sunshine and smiles, with us joking and laughing as we hiked. But then, we started to notice that something wasn't quite right. It started with small things, like how the birds stopped singing and the leaves rustled when there was no wind. But then it escalated. We heard strange noises in the woods, like something was following us. We tried to brush it off, telling ourselves it was just our imaginations, but we couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched by something, or someone. As the day wore on, the forest grew darker and more foreboding. We started to feel lost even though we were following the trail. Again, we could not shake this feeling that something was watching us from the trees, that some unseen force was following us. That night, we camped in a clearing near a small stream. We built a fire and cooked some food up, chatting and laughing as we watched the stars emerge. But as the night wore on, things started to get, uh, strange to say the least. Again, in the distance, we began to hear noises and feeling like somebody was watching us. And after a couple of minutes of us sitting there in silence trying to figure out if it was an animal or some sort of person, something started moving through the underbrush. You know, at first, we really did try to play it off as some sort of raccoon or possum. You know, we've had this scare a couple of times on our own when we did our solo hikes and camping trips and even with family trips, you know, you've, you always have these moments. But we knew that something was wrong when we started seeing eye shine. But the reason why we felt it was wrong was because this eye shine was like seven feet in the air. Now, I can't be certain. It could have been five feet. It could have even been six feet. But it was taller than me, and I'm five foot six, so I had to at least assume it was seven feet tall, and it looked like it was in the air and not hanging off a tree or anything. So we began to get even more freaked out, because it seemed like this thing was taking slow steps coming closer to us in a deliberate manner. It was at this point that we knew our minds were not playing tricks with us, and that we had to do something to either get this thing away from us or get ourselves away from it. Now obviously, if this is some sort of natural creature, this is its home and it would be wrong of us to do anything to harm it, right? Well, that's the mindset we had until this thing started growling and roaring ferociously. It sounded like there were ten dogs at once growling when this thing let out whatever was coming out of its maw. At this point, it began taking deliberate steps, very loud ones, towards us, no longer trying to hide its intention. 
At this point, we both began to yell, scream, and try to make ourselves look bigger like we had heard you were supposed to do with bears and other predators. Now, I can't tell you if this actually worked, but by the grace of God and somehow we got super lucky, a deer actually ran through our sight, plowing through everything, jumped over a bush and began taking off down the hill. And I guess it must have either scared or got the attention of whatever was trying to attack us because I believe it actually started chasing the deer. So by a stroke of just good luck, an unfortunate bad stroke of luck for that deer, we were saved by it running by and becoming this thing's meal ticket. We decided just to stay until morning because it was too dark and we were very lucky that nothing ever came back and messed with us. We slept in intervals and made sure we protect the campsite with the only little protection we had, which were our pocket knives and bear spray. Ultimately, once the morning came, we got out of there very quickly, and now we have a pretty cool story to share. But again, there's a reason people stay on trail and camp at actual campsites. We just hiked, jumped off trail, and camped wherever we felt like it. So, I would not recommend that to people who want to be in a more, probably safe environment. But... Out in the wilderness, there is never truly a safe environment. Solo Hiking in Nepal by Destiny Decides 1995 Solo hiking in Nepal had been on my bucket list my entire life. The Himalayas, the fresh air, and the stunning views of the mountain range were calling my name. And so I set out on my adventure, my backpack on my shoulders and my heart full of excitement. I had spent months saving and preparing for this trip, researching the best trails and packing all the necessary gear. Then I planned to hike the Annapurna Circuit, a 128 mile trek that takes hikers through some of the most stunning landscapes in the world. The first few days of my hike were actually terrific. The landscapes were breathtaking. The locals were actually incredibly welcoming and friendly, and I would stop at small villages along the way, chatting with the locals and learning about their way of life. But on the third day, strange things began to happen. It started with that feeling of unease. I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but something felt off. I didn't know if I was being watched by someone, stalked by someone, or what it was, but there was just, but there was just something off about the way I felt. There was no one around, and I definitely was looking over my shoulder. Then things began to get even more weird. I started hearing strange noises at night, as if someone or something was walking around my tent. I would peek out, but there would never be anything there, just the quiet forest. Then one night, I woke up to find my backpack had been moved from where I had left it. I knew I had left it in a specific spot, but now it was several feet away. It didn't make sense. I really did try to shrug it off and convince myself it was my imagination, but unease persisted. I did of course think it could have just been a hungry animal who was curious or something like that. The locals I encountered on my hike seemed hesitant to talk to me about specific topics. They would quickly change the subject whenever I asked about the area's history or associated legends or myths. Finally, one day, I came across a local shaman. I, I told him all about the strange things that had been happening to me on my hike. He looked at me with concern and said that I had disturbed the spirits of the forest somehow. He told me that offering sacrifices was the only way to appease them. Initially, I, I was hesitant, but the shaman insisted it was the only way to eliminate the curse. And so I offered a goat to the spirits of the forest. That night, I, I finally slept soundly, feeling as if a weight had been lifted from my shoulders. But when I woke up the following day, I found something that made my blood run cold. My backpack was gone, and in place was a note written in a language I could not understand. It was as if the spirits were trying to tell me something, but I couldn't quite decipher it. I knew that I had to leave, so I picked up my remaining belongings and returned down the mountain. I never looked back, afraid of what I might see. To this day, I still don't know what happened to me on that hike in Nepal. I don't know if it was just locals trying to scare me and just robbing me, or if I really had some sort of crazy, some sort of crazy forest spirit after me. I'll never hike alone in Nepal again. Shoot, I probably will never go there again. I'll never forget the strange and unexplained events during those few days. The experience left an indelible impression on me, still haunting me whenever I think about it.
Hostile Fire by Anonymous On the 23rd of June of the year of 2000, a guest at around 1 o'clock at Childers Palace Backpackers Hostel in Queensland, Australia, found themselves stirring. Bleary-eyed and confused, they were initially annoyed that they could hear some banging sounds coming from the hall outside and wondered who would be inconsiderate enough to make such noise in the middle of the night. But as they sat up in bed, they detected something distinct in the air around them, which might have been comforting if they'd known there were log fireplaces in the hostel. Only, there were no fireplaces, and the smell of burning wood was accompanied by thick black smoke trickling into the room from the crack underneath the doorframe. As the guest threw himself out of bed and shook his girlfriend awake, who was sleeping in the bottom bunk, the realization only hit him as the words passed his lips. Get up, get up, the hostel is on fire. As the pair attempted to escape the building, crawling on their hands and knees to avoid inhaling the deadly black smoke, they pounded on their neighbor's doors to save as many lives as possible. Unfortunately, no fire alarms were blaring to warn the guests that anything was wrong. Guests were only roused from their sleep by the warnings of others, and for some of them, those warnings came far too late. It was later reported that the hostel's owner had installed fire alarms in the building, but they had all been deactivated in the weeks before the fire due to the system malfunctioning, which had caused numerous false alarms. To compensate, the hostel's owner had placed fire notes in the walls of the building, which showed the best route to escape and it was these that allowed surviving guests to navigate their way out of the burning building. But the Palace Backpackers Hostel was a hundred years old, two-story timber building, and the fire spread through the old wooden structure with terrifying speed. The guest and his girlfriend fought their way out onto the first floor balcony, and luckily it was not too high of a jump, so they leaped to safety onto the ground below them, tucking and rolling as they landed to ensure they were not injured in the fall. Finally, they found their feet and looked back at the chaotic scene before them. Those that could not fight their way down to the ground floor exits were forced to leap from the balconies and windows onto the roofs of neighboring buildings. Some were too weak to make the jumps and landed in heaps of broken bones, their screams of pains only adding to the frenzy of the flame and smoke. Around 70 backpackers escaped the hostel that night with only 10 suffering minor burns. The final escapees only managed to do so by the swift arrival of the local fire department, who raised ladders to the top floors for those trapped by the flames to climb down. However, 15 backpackers from all over the world were not so lucky and perished. Immediately after the fire, residents of the local town of Childers donated food, blankets, and backpacks to the survivors. A picnic bench in front of the building became a shrine to those lost in the fire, with flowers, heartfelt letters from those who survived, and fruit from the local farms. Twenty survivors returned a few days later to hold an impromptu memorial service with a local Catholic priest at the shrine. The service was broadcast worldwide and significantly impacted the news media. So much so, Princess Anne of the British royal family visited Childers on the 2nd of July, just a week after the blaze, to offer emotional support to the surviving backpackers and others involved in the disaster. The surviving backpackers were taken to a nearby cultural center with the facilities to accommodate them. Local firefighters subsequently questioned them as to how the blaze could have started. Many survivors told them they had woken up in the chaos and had no idea how the fire had been created. The entire hostel had no exposed flames, candles, or fireplaces, but one survivor came forward with information regarding a strange figure hanging outside in the wee morning hours shortly before the flames ripped through this building. The guest told firefighters how he had woken up just after midnight to use the bathroom when they had seen somebody standing outside by a burning trash can. After noticing they were being watched, the figure extinguished the fire and the guest went back to bed, only to be awakened about an hour later to banging sounds, shouting, and black smoke. The investigation quickly shifted from focusing on an accidental fire to one of deliberate arson. And the police then questioned guests regarding any unusual characters hanging around the hostel. Many of them mentioned an aggressive local fruit picker named Robert Long, who had been involved in a couple of run-ins with his fellow guest and was said to have a general disdain for backpackers and tourists. Investigators also discovered that 38-year-old Long had recently been evicted from the hostel after falling behind on the rent. 
They had vowed some form of revenge against the owners, although it was assumed that it was just blustering and that he didn't have it in him to actually seek some sort of retribution. Police then publicly announced that they wished to question Robert Long regarding any involvement with the fire and asked the general public to come forward if they knew of his whereabouts. Five days later, an anonymous caller quickly told authorities that Long was camped in some bushland less than 20 miles from the town where the blaze occurred. Police then drove to the area, searching with a police dog until they found the suspected arsonist campsite. They approached the man calmly asking if they could ask him a few questions about the nature of the fire and the threats he'd made against the hostel in the previous days. Long denied he was even there on the day of the fire, insisting that he had left the hostel on good terms and that the owners were trying to make some sort of scapegoat out of him. But this contradicted the stories of many of the survivors, and police then told Long he was going to be arrested on suspicion of arson. After hearing this, Long took out a knife and threatened the arresting officers' lives. The police dog that accompanied him then was set on the suspect, but Long slashed at the dog so severely that it retreated from him and collapsed into the dirt. The officers then followed up the dog attack, trying to subdue the knife-wielding arson suspect before he could escape. Unfortunately, one of the officers was stabbed in the chin during the arrest and was extremely lucky that Long didn't find their jugular vein. Then, the officer took out their sidearm, took aim, and put a bullet into Long's shoulder to send him crashing to the ground. Disarming him of the knife, he then put handcuffs on the wounded suspect, dragged him to the waiting police car so he could be taken into custody, all while his colleague tried not to bleed out from their stab wound and comforting the injured police dog. Less than two years later, in March of 2002, Robert Long was found guilty of two charges of murder and arson and then sentenced to life in prison by a jury of his peers. The trial judge said Long should serve at least 20 years in jail for his callous and cruel crime. Although 15 individuals died in the fire, Long had only been charged with the two deaths to expedite the whole proceeding and allow other trials to be brought in case of an acquittal. Shockingly enough, and in the face of overwhelming evidence, Long insisted on his innocence and quickly appealed, which was swiftly and thankfully denied. However, in June of this year, Long became eligible for parole, although there has been no news regarding any parole hearings or any subsequent release date being confirmed. As a tribute to those who lost their lives in such a senseless act of premeditated violence, Sydney artist Jasonia Politis was commissioned to paint portraits of those who died in the fire. Josanya said it was the most technically challenging and emotionally charged portrait I have ever undertaken. Perhaps the artist's greatest challenge was to do the victim's appearance justice, given that all she had were photos of them provided by their families. It was a painstaking process, but Josonia managed to arrange them in realistic poses while maintaining the precise images from the photos. The background she researched is typical of the Childers area fields and where they would work picking crops. It was a fitting tribute to the poor, unfortunate souls trapped in the Childers Palace Backpackers Hostel on the night it burned down. A horrifying, avoidable tragedy perpetrated by a callous, evil man who took the lives of 15 innocents in a selfish, childish fit of rage. For as long as I can remember, I have had something of a hyperactive imagination. I get lost in extremely vivid daydreams, and I'm not just talking crap when I use the word vivid. I can smell the scents in the air and feel the texture of the objects beneath my fingers. If I eat or drink something, I can taste it. The wind ruffles my hair and the ground is solid beneath my feet. These daydreams are so hyper-realistic, I have trouble discerning where the dream ends and reality begins. This interesting little quirk always came in handy on the long trips my family took to Florida when I was a kid. It's a pretty long way to go, especially when I was just still a squirmy little bobble-headed toddler who absolutely hated flying in airplanes. Even though the journey itself was always a drag, it was always nice to be able to get away from the cold for a while. You start to forget the feel of the heat of the sun on your face and the endless weeks of gray skies and threatening cloud cover start to drive you crazy. Mom and Dad would work their butts off all year to be able to afford the trip, 
clocking in overtime and clipping coupons all so we could pack our bags and head off to experience a brief respite from the bitter embrace of old man winter. And it was always worth it. Every single penny. The year I turned 16, my dad decided it would be wise to invest in an RV, which would cut down on our travel cost in the long run. I thought our little house on wheels was the greatest thing I had ever seen. I begged my parents to allow me to live in the RV until it got too cold in the fall, but mom was not having it. She claimed I would probably sneak in on my friends at night to drink beer and smoke pot, which of course was exactly what would have happened. Mom was no fool. Five months after dad first parked the RV in our driveway, we were hitting the frosty highway and rolling south. It was the first time I'd ever seen the countryside between our hometown and our destination on such a close and personal level. And throughout the journey, I was at turns amazed, astounded, and bored to tears. I watched DVDs and lost myself in daydreams to pass the hours away, but by the time we rumbled past the Georgia-Florida state line, I was more than ready to put my feet on solid ground for a while. Flying may be expensive and stressful, but it is a heck of a lot faster. We stopped at a rest station near Lake City to load up on vending machine snacks and pump out the sewage tank. As I was checking out the candy bar selection, a deeply tanned older man in a polo shirt and white cargo shorts came wandering up to join me at the vending machine. He looked like a veteran actor of the big screen, still well built in his middle age and handsome in a generic, all-American kind of way. I looked over at him and thought, this guy could sell a ton of kitchen appliances on the home shopping network. He flashed a pearly white grin and said, I like those Snickers bars the best. Leave me a couple, would you? I gave him a dutiful smile in return and started making polite small talk. I learned his name was Devin and he was some kind of business big shot back in Arizona. I asked if he had come to Florida to do some wheeling and dealing, and my rest stop acquaintance waved the suggestion away with an air of vague annoyance. He said, Come on now, everyone needs a vacation now and then, and I've been kicking around on this planet for all these years and I've never seen a real, honest-to-goodness swampland. Now do not get me wrong, the deserts and the plains are pretty damn magnificent, but hell, you gotta get out there and experience new things. You know what I mean? I want to take it all in. I want to sample everything a place like Florida has to offer. Mom yelled at me across the parking lot to hurry up and get my ass in gear, and I realized I had been well on my way to becoming hypnotized by the soothing cadence of Devin's voice. All at once, a small chill skittered down the length of my spine. Something about that grin was making me feel more than a little anxious. I could not help but think that Devin the businessman from Arizona wasn't smiling so much as he was baring his pearly white teeth at me. His gaze was just a little too sharp for someone having a casual conversation with a stranger. I felt like I was being studied, categorized, and filed away for future consideration. I took a few steps back and muttered, Well, I gotta go. Nice meeting you. Pleasure was all mine, son. He called after me, still smiling. I hurried back to the RV with the strangest feeling that I had just had a near miss with disaster. For the rest of the duration of the drive to the campgrounds, I kept scanning every passing vehicle for a figure with an aggressively friendly slash of a smile beneath eyes that never seemed to blink. I did not see him, but I could not shake the notion that Devin from Arizona was following us. We pulled into the campground shortly before noon. Dad backed the RV into our rented lot and sprang into action, humming the theme to the A-Team as he hooked up the water and the electricity, buzzing around in his electric blue clam digger shorts and matching flip-flops like a tacky little tornado. It was the third week of January, but it was a beautiful 71 degrees outside with a clear blue sky. I could smell the ocean in the breeze and the warmth of the sun's rays against my face. It was intoxicating. When we had pulled out our driveway to hit the road, it had just started snowing again, and it was cold enough to freeze the mucus inside of my nostrils. 
It felt good to be away from the gray drudgery of ice and slush, even if it only was for a couple of weeks. I blinked up at the sky and felt my earlier anxiety slide off my shoulders. We were finally here and for the next few weeks, all would be well. Ma and Pa were both pretty bagged from the long day on the road, so we had a mellow day of hanging out beneath the fold-out canopy and roasting hot dogs on our mini grill. I slept like a rock that night, and when I woke up the next morning, I was raring and ready to do some exploring. My parents had chosen a campground beside one of Florida's many conservation areas that year. I'd been given a new digital camera for my birthday and was excited to use it. Now, keep in mind, this was back in the days before cell phones came equipped with half-decent cameras. In fact, I did not even have a mobile phone yet, and would not for several more years. Mom and Dad popped out of the RV at the last second, and instead they tagged along if only to make sure I did not somehow fall into the jaws of the alligators that lived in the stagnant waters of the swamps. I had been planning to burn a bowl or two behind a cypress tree or something, so I was less than enthusiastic when I heard this news. Mom just gave me a knowing smile and patted me on the top of my head. Once again, my mom was no fool. We wandered into the park and took a map from a display in front of a dilapidated building with a faded sign that proclaimed it to be the Visitor's Information Center. I noticed a tall man leaning on the ledge at the open sliding window, chatting with the parks and rec worker inside, and I realized with a nasty start that it was none other than Arizona Devon, the vaguely menacing tourist I had met at the rest stop the day before. He appeared to be flirting with the woman working the information booth, and if the entranced expression on her face was any indication, it appeared to be working. Mom grunted, Come on kiddo, let's go get eaten alive in this dirty damn swamp. She hauled me away by the arm, dad stomping along behind us in his mirrored sunglasses and a ridiculous smear of zinc oxide along the length of his nose. My mom managed to convince him to change out the flip-flops, but he refused her demand to not change into another pair of his cringe-inducing clam diggers. They were banana yellow in color, and they flapped around his shins as he walked, which provided enough hilarity for me to almost forget about the unexpected appearance of Mr. Arizona with his impeccably combed hair and sparkling slash of a grin. Almost, that is. I looked back over my shoulder just in time to see Devin disappearing through the front door of the building, which was being held open for him by the woman from the information booth. She had an expression of rapturous adoration in her face, as if she were completely enthralled by his presence. The door clunked shut, and I found myself slowing to a halt staring after them with a strange lump of dread in my stomach. Dad blundered into me from behind and bellowed. Watch where you're going, dummy. I'm trying to look at the map here. I scurried away from his irritation and hurried after my mom, who was marching along the trail at a brisk power walker's pace. She snapped. Hurry up, you two. You both need more exercise. Especially you, Harold. You sit there every night eating those potato chips and watching the TV. And you t Just look at that gut. You're starting to look pregnant. Dad muttered. Huh. You're a riot, ain't ya? and shoved the map in his back pocket. Mom militantly marched us along the trail like a drill instructor, hectoring us to keep up the pace, until we finally rebelled and stopped at a footbridge to take some pictures. The footbridge spanned a watery stretch that deepened as it led out into deeper reaches of the swamp. As I looked down into the dark sheen of the sluggish water below our feet, there was a rolling disturbance on the surface and I caught a brief glimpse of a thick, scaly tail. I tried to snap a quick picture but the alligator was already gone, leaving only bubbles and ripples in its wake. Dad whistled and said, Holy moly, that was a big one. I read they don't really attack people very often, but I sure as hell don't want to get too close to one if I could help it. Mom smirked and made a jab about alligators preferring a low-fat diet, which made Dad clench his teeth and shoot back, You're right, what am I scared of alligators for when I already live with a goddamn harpy? They started to bicker at each other, and I interrupted by pointedly clearing my throat and grumbling. Mom? Dad? Can you guys just, like, walk ahead of me or something? 
Argue somewhere I don't gotta hear it for crying out loud? Mom snapped. Why, so you can smoke some pot? Fine, come on Harold, let your pothead son get his fix or whatever he calls it. Let's go. Dad shot me a dark look and growled. You better not have any dope on you, kid. We drove across state lines. They walked away in a huff, still taking cranky little jabs at each other, and I shook my head as they stomped out of sight. As soon as they were gone, I pulled out my pipe and my bag. Mom was right, of course. I offered my father a silent apology and packed a bowl. The swamp took on an ethereal, dreamlike quality as the THC soaked into my brain. I was still pretty new to smoking pot, and like most beginners, when I got high, I got really high. The smoke hit me like a sack of spongy bricks, whomp, and I was soon blinking out at cypress trees with red eyes and a dopey grin on my face. It struck me that this was an ancient place, fundamentally unchanged for thousands of years. I drifted into a daydream of what life had been for the first human inhabitants, generation after generation living and dying within the groves, stalked by panthers and stalking them in turn, dancing around a fire beneath a blaze of stars over the canopy, sweating in syncopated rhythm in the humid air, hunting and fighting and loving and fearing the embrace of death. A hand suddenly descended on my shoulder, making me screech and jump six inches in the air. I whirled around and discovered the lady from the visitor's information center standing behind me. She let out a strangely mechanical giggle and said, Whoa, you're a jumpy one, aren't you? I think one of you guys must have dropped this. She handed me a dirty, wrinkled map. The same map my dad stuffed into the back pocket of his hideous shorts earlier in our ill-fated family hike through the park. I took it from her and offered a sheepish apology for littering. She gave me a grin and chirped, Hey, no problem, accidents happen. Where'd your parents go? I knew that she could smell the weed in the air. I tried to put on an air of casual unconcern and said, Oh, they're just up a little way. They, um... I trailed off and stared at her with growing unease. There was something about the park lady's grin that was unsettlingly familiar. I gotta get going. I finished and tried to smile back. Thanks for picking up the map for us. See ya. I took maybe five steps before I was stopped dead by the sound of Devin's voice booming out from behind me. Full of hearty and dark good humor, he said. I peeked into your head, and I saw it too. The natives and fire, the stars and the night sky, all of it. You have got the sight, kid. I knew from the moment I smelled your scent at the rest stop. A lot of people have a touch of the sight, just a touch, but not like you. In another life, you would have made a great medicine man. I slowly turned around with my heart beating hard in my chest. The lady from the information booth was gone, and Devin stood in her place. He held up a red hairband and said, That's all I need. A life. A personal item. And there it is. I will own her face for the rest of my years. Pretty neat trick, huh? I gaped at him, too shocked to speak out loud. Finally, I cleared my throat and squeaked. What? What are you? I mean, holy crap, how did you do that? Devin tucked the hairband in the breast pocket of his shirt and said, Well, I guess you could call me a witch. A very specific kind of witch. Folks back home would call me a skimwalker. Personally, I don't like that name very much, but it's what they'd call me. I slowly shook my head, my jaw hanging open in shock, and Devin clicked his tongue in disappointment. It's true. No, I would tell you something. Boy, I'm an old son of a gun. No, no. I can remember watching Abraham Lincoln roll past in a convoy of horse-drawn buggies. That is how old I am. See this face here? This is not me. I killed this man in the bottom of a gas station years ago. Ate him right up. My real face? Well, you don't ever want to see that, believe me. If I show you my true face, it'll be the last thing you ever see. I could do nothing but shake my head again. I was struggling to keep myself from fainting dead away from fright. Devin beamed at my fear and shook his head in unison with my mute denial. He exclaimed, 
Well, you're going to see for yourself. One way or another. Let us get down to business, partner. I'm a businessman, after all. See, I am tired of kicking around the empty old desert all the time. Everyone needs a vacation now and then. Sure, but me, I need something more uh, substantial than that. Call it a leave of absence, if you will. I want to see the world, but it is not nearly so much fun when you're doing it alone. It would be nice to have a travel buddy or two. I could teach you, kid. I could show you how to be like me. I could teach you how to wear different faces. You could live so long it might as well be forever. What do you think of that? My answer was to abruptly whirl around and start running my ass off. I tried to get off the footbridge as quick as possible. The thing behind me snarled. Ugh, that was a real bad choice, kid. And heavy footsteps pounded on the splintery old boards behind me. I screamed for help, but the air around me became thick and curiously flat. My voice fell dead inches from my lips. Ain't nobody gonna help you. The skimwalker screamed, and in his voice it was, it was so dark and triumphant with hunger. The confident greed of a predator who never fails to secure its prey. I do not know if it was from the extreme stress of the situation at hand, but all at once my mind drifted sideways, and from one footfall to the next I stepped out of reality and into the daydream. The natives were gathered at the other side of the bridge, the ancient one from another time. They looked like they were pissed right off. One of them drew back his bow and uttered a hoarse war cry and let the arrow fly. The stone-tipped projectile whistled past my head and I heard it thunk into my pursuer. It was only a scant moment away from sinking its claws into my back. It let out a jagged screech of surprise and agony. I turned just in time to see a towering, slump-shouldered figure stagger back into a guardrail and flip over to the water below with a tremendous splash. The arrow was protruding from its eye socket. The monstrous thing fought and struggled to the surface. It had time to roar. I'll leave you alive. And then a churning commotion boiled in with eerie speed. Several streaks of boiling water and whipping tails from all directions. The skimwalker opened his cavernous mouth to scream again, and it was yanked underneath with tremendous force. There was more gurgled screaming, a lot of flailing of arms and legs, and the water went red with blood. Devin the Skimwalker may have been a big deal out there in the deserts of Arizona, but in the watery swamplands of central Florida, the mighty alligator reigned supreme. I stood at the bank and watched as its struggles grew rapidly weaker. When I saw an arm float to the surface, I knew it was done. I started to turn away, but something bobbling in the water caught my eye. I fished it out with a stick and stared at it with horror. I had been hoping... The whole incident was just a part of my hyper-realistic daydream, but the dripping hair tie I was holding was very real. I tucked it away in my pocket and whispered, Tourists gotta watch out for the gators, Devin. Everyone knows that. I was surprised to see the natives from the daydream were still gathered near the end of the bridge. I raised a hand to them, and they returned my greeting, their faces solemn and watchful. One of them pointed to himself, then to me, and then up to the sky. With that, they faded away into nothing before my eyes. I am not completely sure what he was trying to say. Not exactly, but I think I got the gist of it. He was a part of me, and we were both parts of a greater reality. I hurried up to catch my mom and dad before I stepped to throw up into some bushes. My heart was pounding, and my legs were shaking uncontrollably. I felt like I might pass out. I gasped, holy crap, and I wiped my mouth with the side of my shirt. Wow, now I know this is a pretty big pill to swallow, but there's still more. After I was finished tossing up my breakfast, I ran ahead on the trail, but I could not find my parents anywhere. I eventually doubled back and found them standing on the bridge, yelling my name at the top of my lungs. Mom freaked the hell out when I came jogging up to them. She said they came sneaking back to the bridge shortly after they'd left in an effort to catch me in the act of smoking my illicit dope, but I was nowhere to be seen. It was almost as if I had disappeared into thin air. 
Dad spotted what looked like a shoe floating just below the surface, and they both promptly went into hysterics. They thought I actually somehow ended up falling into the water and was eaten alive by gators. I looked down into the water and there was in fact a shoe bobbing around a few yards away from the bridge. It was one of Devin's spiffy boat shoes, and I was fairly sure there was still a foot inside of it. Although, I obviously did not share this fact with my parents. It must have broken off during the feeding frenzy. Staring at it made a wave of nausea roll through my guts, and I promptly looked away. I calmed my parents down by telling them that they were right. Being the conniving teenage miscreant that I was, I tricked them into walking ahead, and that I'd slipped away from the trail to smoke a few bowls because I was a dirty, disrespectful little bastard of a pothead. I stoically endured the rain of slaps delivered by my enraged mother, who had, who had been a mere second away from melting down into a full-blown fit before I came scrambling down the trail. They confiscated my pipe and weed, and Mom declared that I was grounded for the duration of the vacation. No TV, no sightseeing, no fun at all. I pretended to be heartbroken, with disappointment, but in reality that was just fine and dandy by me. I just had more than enough excitement to last me quite a while. I overheard my mom and dad talking about the disappearance of a park employee the next day. Dad put forth the possibility that the shoe he had seen in the water may have belonged to her, and mom being a true crime fanatic since the early 90s, breathlessly speculated she may have been killed by a jilted ex-boyfriend. I gazed into an open magazine and pretended not to hear the conversation. The shoe had not belonged to the missing park employee, but the hair tie in my pocket certainly did, and I knew the police would never find her body. She had been devoured, whole and screaming, by a monster wearing stolen skin. And then, in an ironic twist of fate, the ancient creature finally got a taste of its own medicine, so to speak, at the jaws of the alligators. <laughs> sorry about that. I do not usually like puns, but this one time, I could not resist. As for me, I still have daydreams sometimes, although it is never as vivid and real to me as it was when I was a kid. As the years passed, I found myself doubting the incident, and actually, I thought that maybe I made it up at one point. It seems far more likely that I suffered from some kind of epileptic, petite mal seizures, as kids sometimes do, and the whole thing was just an hallucination or something. Or, so I tell myself anyway. It does not explain the hair tie, nor does it explain the broken arrow shaft floating in the water. I ended up throwing the hair tie out the window as we were heading back home, up the I-95, I didn't want it anymore. Looking at it made me feel weird and, you know, I don't want to have evidence like that on me. I may have possessed the power of clairvoyance once upon a time. Or I may have had a childhood neurological disorder. I cannot say for sure which one is correct. But I can say this. Even monsters need to go on vacation now and then. And when they do, they should probably stay within their element if they know what I mean. Because no matter how big and bad a monster you are, there is always something a whole lot worse. Thanks for listening to these creepy and allegedly true backpacking horror stories sent in by viewers just like you. As always, if you have a story that you would like to share in a future episode, be sure to submit them at swampdweller.net or at the email you can find in the description down below. If you prefer to send them in on Reddit, you can go to r slash the dark swamp and send it in there. If you enjoyed these stories tonight, please be sure to slap that like button a bit as it really does help me out a ton. Subscribe if you're new as it helps the swamp continue to grow its ever-expanding waters. Make sure you turn on notifications so you don't miss any new episodes. I upload them nearly every single day and all things natural and supernatural. I'd love to know what story was your favorite tonight in the comments down below as it helps me pick better stories in the future. If you made it all the way to the end, today's code word is purple horror. Be sure to comment that down below to confuse anybody who doesn't make it to the end. And also, whoever makes the most creative comment with the code word will win a free t-shirt. Thank you guys for supporting the swamp the way you do. I couldn't do this on a daily basis without you all. Be sure to join me on social media. Don't forget, I have a Spanish channel now, so if you are into Spanish narrations and scary stories, be sure to check out that channel, Swamp Dweller Espanol, and I'll see you all soon with another creepy episode.